Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? The news this week includes the first suspected case of COVID-19 in Hunan, a timely but unpleasant anniversary of human clinical trials, a remarkable but still somewhat confusing fourth person who has been cured of HIV, Scientists being extra creepy this week by making zombie spiders into robots. A summary of all of the craziest fads that Oprah has fielded to the public, which have had adverse effects, and the discovery of a new chemical reaction that could well explain how life started on Earth. The timestamps for each of these news items and others can be found in the description box below. Let's start with the suspected first case of COVID-19 in Hunan. Hunan is a smaller subsection of Wuhan, and it's where the seafood market that was suspected to be the origin of COVID-19 is located. The team of 18 scientists from across the globe believe that by tracking the various movements and other things, they have been able to identify what is effectively patient zero or at least the earliest patients. There is, however, no definitive proof of this, and this is a very important caveat. The study also has other concerns, primarily that of the 174 people the World Health Organization includes in their report, they are amongst these. Those 174 people were then cut down to 155 who lived near the Yangtze River. This is where the market is located, and that it is where the highest density of cases was in the early days of the outbreak. They then took the infected group and compared it to the general population in the same situation. Those who lived closest to the market fundamentally had a higher chance, and so this is a So this is a case of correlation does not equal causation, and it is entirely a retrospective analysis, which is another reason to take this with a grain of salt. The evidence they're relying on, other than a simple numbers game in proximity, is the probability of going to hospital as a result of infection with COVID-19, and they argue that since 66% of people hospitalized before January 2020 were directly tied to the market, there must be some association there. This, however, does not account for the other 34%. The remaining 34%, as they describe it, lived closer to the market, but didn't have any direct contact with it. And so there's a lot of unexplained material here that really does confound what they're saying. The researchers summarize their results and point out that the earliest days associated the Hunan market itself with the epidemic, but now they're saying that it's not necessarily the market itself, but those who are in greatest proximity to it. That means even if you were not working there, as long as you lived in the area, you had greater probability of being infected. And this means that they believe there's something in the area, but not necessarily the market that underlies the cause. This is why investigation of the market internally helps to narrow down what's happening, and they believe that there is a very specific hotspot, and this can be traced to a single stall within the market that was selling mammals, mammals which can, by virtue of being mammals, carry COVID-19. So this doesn't necessarily answer the origins, but it does begin to provide more evidence as to what the carrier may be. The next is a anniversary event, let's say. It has now been 50 years since the Tuskegee experiment went ahead. This might also be called a clinical trial, but for all the wrong reasons. The Tuskegee experiments are notorious, because they pretty much took black men and women, gave them syphilis, and tracked what happened to them after the fact. This was not informed, it was not agreed to, there was no consent, and it certainly was not ethical. Once it was found out, there was huge public outcry, and the Associated Press goes into a very good article as to what happened, why, and fundamentally, everything else associated with this, frankly, scandalous event. Syphilis, if you aren't aware, is a 
pathogen that is spread by intercourse. If left untreated, and it can be treated with relatively common antibiotics, it does move very quickly and can have long-term effects. This includes things like deformation of bone, can cause deafness, blindness, heart disease, sterility, neurological disorders, and more. This is why infecting so many people without their consent and then tracking them to see what happens is a big problem. Highly questionable trials like that are one thing, but it's where we have unknown cures that we have a big problem. This generates both false hope for those who claim that something else can be the result of curing, or that they will be another exception. HIV is particularly notorious for this. Many people claim to be able to control their HIV, and for some this is true. They may not deteriorate, but that doesn't mean that they are cured of it. It just means the symptoms and effects are no longer causing problems. They can still infect others. There have been less than a handful of people who have been cured of HIV. Everybody else is one of three categories. Denial, dead, or being treated. The 66-year-old man from California is only the fourth person who has been definitively shown to be cured of HIV. Curing it is very hard for one simple reason. It hides very well and it disables a very important part of the immune system, that is, the memory cells associated with keeping a hold of the necessary ability to make antibodies against it. The way he was treated is radical, and that's an important thing to keep in mind here. It is a radical treatment for another condition, that is leukemia. In 2019, he received a bone marrow transplant with completely new stem cells for all of the cells in his blood, this includes the B cells in the immune system. Because of this, he became resistant to HIV. After going forwards, he eventually found that he had been cured of HIV and having had it wiped from his system by virtue of the chemotherapy and then bone marrow transplant. This is not a viable treatment option for anyone and everyone, and it was given under very specific circumstances for a different condition. The reason it's not for everyone is that it requires that you have an appropriate matching donor for the bone marrow and that you completely destroy the immune system before transplanting that bone marrow. This means that you have a period where there is incredibly high risk, you have a very narrow selection of people who will donate the bone marrow needed, and you have to hope that the person who's receiving it does not develop complications, or worse yet, has the treatment, and then still has HIV. Next is another study, and this study, rather than being a case study, is looking at a rather miraculous claim about dietary supplements. The researchers basically say that if you have more resistant starch in your diet, you have a 60% reduction in the chance of various kinds of cancer, mostly looking at bowel cancers. This is a very bold claim, and they would need some very strong evidence to support it. And what they have is something, but it's not enough by itself. The trial ran for 20 years and involved about a 1,000 people across the globe. Those with that higher percentage of resistant starches had lower risk of cancer. This is particularly notable in the upper part, so the small intestine. As you look further into the details, there were also benefits for the esophagus and the pancreas. The researchers themselves also note that the result is unexpected, very large, and exciting, but as with most good research, they state that they need to replicate the findings in other studies and other groups. If you don't do that, you've just found one-off, interesting, unusual, and wonderful results that if no one else can get, don't really mean a great deal. If you aren't looking at just fibre type foods, but those that are rich in it, things like oats, pasta, rice, peas and beans are examples of foods that are considered beneficial from this study. These are foods that are high in a variety of different proteins, low in fat, low in simple sugars, 
but high in complex sugars, so they break down slowly and are then used by the body in a more effective manner. The same dietary advice that's been given out for decades now. The other big caveat to this study is that it was based on those with Lynch syndrome, and they received either the supplement or no supplement, and they followed them for 10 years in a double blind, which means they swapped what they were getting halfway through. This is another complication in extrapolating these research results outside of the study. The still somewhat high for the general population, but very low for those with Lynch syndrome population results are a good indication that this might be useful for that pathology particularly, but it would be good to know if the general public would benefit from it. Other questions that continue to persist in research include things like why IVF embryos fail to develop. IVF is still used quite extensively across the world in most developed nations. Many older people benefit from its use. In fact, there have been examples of those who are in their 70s becoming pregnant through the use of assistive reproductive technology and IVF. Despite this, there is still a very high failure rate. And so you need to look at what's happening to get both the best outcomes for those who are participating, and ensure that there is no unnecessary pain, suffering, and loss. This extends to both embryos that will be successful, and the ones that are not successful. Studying in this area can help in understanding what's happening with genetic disorders and chromosomal abnormalities. Later on, if it's a more advanced embryo, you can also examine things like gestational developmental disorders. Primarily though, at the earlier stage, you're looking at chromosomal and genetic disorders, when these cells replicate DNA and split. That splitting process is where the chromosomes can go wrong, and the replication process is where the DNA can go wrong. The researchers believe that damage to the DNA is what can trigger some of these issues around the success of embryos once they've been fertilized, and why there is a very high failure rate to start with, and a 60% failure rate for those that at least start dividing. They think that there's damage to the DNA, and that it can create the necessary interruption to the sequence in that double strand, it could prevent the chromosomes from splitting properly, and thereby creating an equal distribution. Without that, you have problems for both of the offspring. Both cells will have issues. The two daughter cells will either have not enough DNA and therefore an incomplete genome, or too many copies of a genome and therefore may not be able to properly transcribe and translate the content. Another study from this week that has been generating waves is around the use of antidepressants. Primarily SSRIs, or Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. The study has been claimed by various sources to prove that SSRIs aren't a good choice, despite the fact that they are the most widely used antidepressant across the globe. The issue here is the study that has given rise to this belief is not about the use of SSRIs, and that is a big problem. The idea with an SSRI is that it blocks the other nerve from either recycling or blocking the serotonin from being reuptake or reabsorbed after it's been released. This means it sits in between two neurons for longer and there's more opportunity for it to attach to its receptor and initiate the signal that it needs to send. This leads to the article in question. The article from Nature Molecular Psychiatry was a systematic review. That is, it took the existing studies, used certain criteria to include or exclude them, and then looked at the serotonin levels in people with depression. That is, it was looking at serotonin and depression, not the amount of serotonin in those who were being treated for depression with SSRIs. This is very important. It was not looking at medication and the effect. It was describing the people who were then going to be treated with this. This leads to the primary conclusion of that study, the tenet of all these articles claiming that antidepressants won't work anymore. There was no evidence that depressed people had less serotonin or abnormal serotonin levels compared to non-depressed people. This, however, is not what antidepressants do. 
They do not add more serotonin. They simply give more chance for the serotonin that is already there, that is the otherwise normal level, to bind to its receptor and act. That is a very different function and mechanism than simply saying that serotonin isn't important. The way this has been represented is very different to what's actually been found, and this is a very good reason why you should have a discussion with your medical professional if you either have questions about, concerns over, or think you will need medication like Zoloft, Prozac, and other similar medication. That is because the way it's being portrayed is not what it actually was, and it's perhaps the biggest reason why the study, if we were to call it that, has been panned almost universally by other researchers in the same field who explain that, no, what you're seeing here is not the same thing as what you're concluding it is related to. There is a big gap in between the two. Turning to environmental news and more a bit of unusualness rather than anything that's especially amazing, let's say, more that it's horrifying. Yet a third body has been found in Lake Mead. This is a large lake found in America, and it is now at historic lows after a drought has been running for an incredibly long time. A third body, and this is not including all the other things that have been found in said lake. It includes cars, boats, fallen debris, animals, and more. The reality is that as the lake continues to recede, there is a good chance that they will continue to find more weird and wonderful things in there, probably including more dead bodies. In an ideal world, it will allow them to close currently open murder cases. In a less ideal world, it's going to allow them to close long cold dead or missing body cases. In the worst case scenario, it's about to open up a whole new sleuth of murder cases. One more study, and this time we're throwing you back to STDs, but for a different reason, and it's more a evolutionary immunology type element to it, and that is the uh, relationship between an STI and possibly longevity in life, primarily longevity in life for women. Generally speaking, women tend to have a better immune system than males, except during pregnancy. This means that over the long term, women will tend to live longer than men. This is of course a simplistic analysis, as there's many other factors, such as cardiovascular disease, exposure, jobs, and etc. The uh, competition though, especially when we talk about the immune system, means that there is a good chance that you may have a longer life, because you are less having to worry about various diseases. One theory that's being put forward in a study is that gonorrhea might explain why grandmothers, as a result of that better immune system, and as a result other health benefits, exist. They live longer because they have a better immune system, which benefits them in other ways throughout their life, leading to old age and success in that. They base this conclusion on looking at Neanderthals, Denisovians, and Homo sapiens. Only Homo sapiens, or humans as we are now, have a particular immune receptor in their genome. With this, it allows them to have that immunological advantage that the others didn't. They believe that gonorrhea may have been what caused the adaptation and retention of this particular receptor. That is because it can pick up on gonorrhea, whereas without it, you can't, and so an STI would not only stay, but would likely have its effect very quickly. The effects of gonorrhea, other than the fact you're unwell, can include things like sterility. Therefore, having it, and being able to get rid of gonorrhea, or at least control it, gave Homo sapiens the advantage over Neanderthals and Denisovians when it comes to reproduction. The following advantages that the body used and adapted from this over time include things that would help with the brain, and in this context, protecting itself from things like aging, Alzheimer's, and other diseases that focus on the neurological systems. Having not only protected itself from an STI, which allowed the species to explode and have a better chance of success, 
it also meant that there were other protections that it could modify and adapt from it, and all coming down to whether or not humans were able to protect themselves from a particular STI. Unusual as that is, the world is full of weird and wonderful things. This includes a really bizarre creature. You can see it here, and it is honestly quite weird. It is a combination of flower, tentacles, and possibly Japanese anime of the uh, adult variety. The creature was observed from the Nautilus. It's a ocean exploring vehicle run by the Ocean Exploration Trust. This bizarre creature is about 40 centimeters as far as its tentacles go, and it has a roughly two meter long stalk or main body. It appears to have barbs on the tentacles. There are cup-like polypy things on it, very much like an octopus, and it moves relatively freely, just under 3,000 meters below the surface of the ocean. Yeah, the deep dark places of the ocean are full of creepy scary things. Of course, you don't need to go that far down into the ocean to see creepy scary. In fact, you need only find your local researchers and see what they're doing with dead spiders. They're reanimating them into zombies, creating undead robots. Yes, mechanical engineers have finally found their way into the world of arachnids, and they've thought, great, let's make this thing move after it's dead. And we really wish they hadn't. They're turning the spiders into something like the claw you would have in one of those arcade games. The idea is, it's meant to be able to grip and pull and move things. Yeah, please don't do that. Proving that engineers have a sense of humour at least, they have named their undead spider robots Necro-Robotics. Thank you. As though Necrons weren't bad enough, now we have Necro-Robotics, made from spiders. The inspiration from this comes from seeing a dead spider all curled up in a corner somewhere and thinking, I wonder if that could be useful, or at least that's supposed to be the origin of this worrying development. The whole design uses a small chamber called a prosoma chamber, which contracts, and this sends fluid into the legs, and from this they extend. When you remove the fluid from said chamber, they contract, and now you have a basic robot that can grab stuff. Just why? Why would you make this? Nature itself is already terrifying enough, you don't need to make spiders any more horrifying. For example, fungus that makes basically fungus-ridden flies mate with dead flies. Yeah, the fungus is called Entomophthora muscae, and its survival strategy is as described. Infect fly, have fly try to reproduce with dead fly, and wind up making more fungus-filled flies. The survival strategy is actually quite ingenious, albeit terrifying. The way it works is that it infects female flies and it tries to get them up somewhere high, where it releases spores and hopes to infect more hosts. Where that doesn't happen, it attracts male flies to the female and the male fly, being a horny male fly, does what they do, and this then becomes infected with the fungus. It can then go on to spread it to more new hosts. What is the truly bizarre thing about flies is that they seem to be necrophiliacs. The longer a female fly is dead, the more of the male Z attracts, or at least a greater percentage. The research indicates that between 3 and 8 hours, you have 15% of the male flies. Between 25 and 30 hours, this was 73%. Yeah. Flies, you got some explaining to do. Next is more environmental type news, but in this case, looking at genetically modified rice, and the rice yields 40% more for what it is. The uh, variety itself comes out of China, and the uh, genes aren't actually anything new. Rather, they've simply added a second copy. And this is what has increased that yield by such a large margin. 
the genes help it to bring in more fertilizer. By doing that, you can increase the amount of photosynthesis, which in turn can increase growth and then flowering. This then leads to more fruiting bodies, or in this case, grains in the form of rice. In theory, if this was applied to other crops, you could either try and increase the number of genes that are most useful for that, or possibly use this gene and introduce it. Next, we have an article from Cracked, and it looks at Oprah and how she has made the world worse. Oprah is who gave us Dr. Oz, and Dr. Oz, as you may have seen from the last week with the somewhat viral Dr. Oz attack ad video, has done a lot of harm. His beginnings would never have happened without Oprah, but he is not the only one. Dr. Phil is another, and while the ranch is hilarious and some of the things we see on that show just are funny, the rest of what he does is a lot of junk, and unfortunately, that is what Oprah is responsible for. Oprah is also responsible for the uh, increase in popularity, let's say, of Susan Summers, who was trying to sell all kinds of quackery. And what is perhaps Oprah's second biggest faux pas is hosting Jenny McCarthy and helping to promote anti-vaxxers. Something that she should never have done and should spend the rest of her life finding every tree and apologizing profusely for the waste of oxygen that is anti-vaxxers. This week we also have uh, worrying news that you have no control over. That is, space debris that will come down with the next Chinese rocket that is going to crash back to Earth in an uncontrolled manner. Thankfully, we have scientists calculating the probability of some of that space junk killing you. The mathematical modeling used about 30 years worth of data, that is satellite data, tracking of various extraterrestrial objects, and so on. They then tried to figure out whether or not it will land somewhere where you have, for example, a relatively large population, or somewhere where you would have basically no one, for example, the middle of the ocean. They found that if you live in somewhere like Indonesia, Bangladesh, or Nigeria, you have more concern than those in the US, China, or Russia. That's already a problem, but then what are the chances of somebody having a, well, fatal encounter of the extraterrestrial kind if they live in one of these places? They found that if the debris is spread over a roughly 10 square meter area, there's a 10% chance of there being one or more casualties over the next decade on average. This means that you're going to find that there is a 10% chance that somebody will die every 10 years. There are, of course, ways to avoid this. The most obvious and effective is controlled re-entry, something most responsible countries do already. The final bit of news we have for you this week is all about how a certain set of chemical reactions could be how life started on Earth. There have been various studies looking at what was required to get life to begin whether that is as amino acids, nucleic acids, RNA, DNA, and more. There have even been those who have tried to get life to spontaneously occur. This last group has not been successful yet. What's required is a particular shift in how the reaction is going to happen. What they needed was a biological process that would be able to use the chemistry of the early primordial Earth. And the key ingredient? Ironically, cyanide. Cyanide could be used as the key to creating basic organic molecules. And this is not in any exciting environment. Rather, it's at room temperature, or between 20 and 25 degrees, depending on what your standard is, and a very wide range of pH. So long as you had some carbon dioxide to add to this, everything went along very smoothly. They were even able to start making complex organic molecules like amino acids. These can then build up and create proteins. Proteins build up and make cells. Cells make tissues, tissues make organs, organs make systems, and systems make a whole organism. 
All of this was done without the use of enzymes, which is how just about every cell in your body does it. That means that there is a way for organic molecules to fundamentally spontaneously assemble under the right conditions and start creating what is needed for even more complex machinery at a cellular level to create even more complex but more efficient means of producing cell contents. That's all the news we have for you this week. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions that you have below.